Okay, so we just came off of the tail end of beating the game, so we're now on our final thoughts. So, how do we feel about the game on the whole? How do we... F do we feel it's stood up? Do we feel it's worth playing? I guess the short answer is... I mostly had fun playing the game. I think for the most part, it actually held up, especially in comparison to other games that we streamed. Is it the best game ever? Not really. But I think it does a lot of interesting things, they just don't all necessarily work. I do think one of the weak points of the game is that there are a lot of mechanics to kind of change up this system where it's like a 3D fighting, uh, you, ex you have mostly just a top-down view, explore the dungeons, all enemies can be seen and potentially dodged, um, before you initiate what we'll consider arena combat where it locks you into a 1v1. And there's a lot of interesting ideas that if they had just done them, if they had actually executed them well, I would have been like gushing praise for this game. And it's such a shame. There's like so many little mechanics in the game that are either not entirely explained or are useless. <laughs> you could pick you could pick one and that will determine how much fun you have with the game. So, I guess since Combat is a majority of this game. We'll start with combat before we talk about plot or anything else. So I like the idea that you can swap into potentially up to three major weapon types throughout the game. You have daggers, which are fast, uh, but with short reach. You have the sword, which is kind of like the middleman between that and the axe. And the axe is like the slow heavy hitter. I think the problems with the combat become kind of apparent over time. I don't mind the fact that you gradually unlock moves as you find new weapons and armor via the uh, plot device of the scepter, which will basically memorize an item and restore it and can be used for puzzles and stuff like that. But I think the big issue is that like, honestly, like 90% of the special moves you unlock are just absolutely useless. I mean, like, honestly, chat, do you remember any of them being, like, super great? Like, aside from unlocking Triple Slash with Sword, which is definitely the one of the best ones to unlock. It makes the sword actually good. Um, we had, like, what, Dagger Uppercut? And that was it. Honestly, I think that was it in terms of moves. And it's sad because, like, you input it kind of like a fighting game. Like, you do left down, right attack. You do right down, left attack. You do, like, the 360 rotations on some of these attacks. Um, and they're just so bad. I, I think it's a problem is they wanted them to be, like, really cool looking. But because everything has, like, such a long windup, you just get hit out of it. Like, there's a couple attacks that are kind of more niche, and, like, sometimes we found use of them in the game, and mostly that's because the AI forgot to block them. Like, the axe overhead strike generally hit. Not because it's a good move, just sometimes the AI doesn't react to it, and it does damage. Or, like, the sword double strike. If you space it really, really well against a slower enemy, it was sometimes useful, but... Again, like, as a principle for doing these kinds of games in combat, you should not be able to measure the startup of a move in seconds in a fighting game, basically. Because that the kind of it's kind of what it feels like, like a slow a little slower than average fighting game. And it's just like, wow. Wow, that's the, like the two second wind up on like the attack that is completely blockable by the enemy. It doesn't feel good. I like, for example, that, you know, you're fighting in kind of like not quite top down, but kind of like pulled back uh, third person camera in the battle itself. For the most part, the controls of like side dashing or running are, you know, they feel fairly responsive. There's a little bit of lag at the end of some of the moves, so they might not do like quick responsive things that you want them to do like sidestepping into a strike um i don't think they have like the equivalency of a buffer so it's kind of easy to have attacks dropped if you press them too early while dodging um and sadly some of the better moves can't be used after a dodge so what could have been like really cool dodge mechanics just don't really work out or at least i didn't get them to work out in the playthrough 
which is a bit disappointing. I did like the idea of like you could circle circle straight around enemies. They don't have like a full guard necessarily. They guard like just in front of them. There are enemies that had increasingly annoying gimmicks as the game went on, like they summoned a shield that was impenetrable and you have no attacks at all that could get through it and you just have to wait. Or the fact that like enemies without shields can just guard infinitely and they react to your button presses. So if you just try to mash attack over and over, they will legitimately block you for like 12 minutes plus until you stop attacking. And also, I think throughout the game, we saw points where your attacks were negative on hit. Like normally, again, this is something I think of more with like fighting games with frame advantage. Like the whole point is if you hit them once, you should be able to hit them twice, maybe hit them into your finisher. And a lot of the enemies about halfway into the game just straight up punish you for using combos, even though you're hitting them, which is an extremely bad moment for game feel. And I'm very disappointed they went that way towards the last half of the game. Um, sadly, also, Axe really fell off quick. I think chat would agree. I think outside of like two enemy types, Axe was just bad. Like, I think the intent was that it's supposed to be a slow, powerful weapon, but like legitimately every enemy by like the halfway point completely outspeeds you. So even if you attack first and we're counting like 10, 20 frames, 10, 20, 30 frames, faster than the enemy, the enemy will still beat you in the attack. Like, that's insane. That's insane how slow the axe is, and it just became basically one of my least favorite weapon types because of that. It really needed some kind of double strike combo to make it feel a little more viable, like maybe you try to really prep the swing before you hit them. But a lot of the enemies, as I said before, halfway through the game or beyond, have like quick thrusts, or they have sweeping attacks, or they have more reactive guards. So you don't really have a way to break their guard with the heavy weapon, which feels extraordinarily counterintuitive. And yeah, they just completely outspeed you. So we stopped using axes more or less immediately after the point where the game very obviously wanted you to use them because they were just way too slow in any kind of casual sense. So Honestly, if they had fixed Axe to combo a little better or to have like an inherent guard break mechanic, like if, if getting hit by the Axe staggered them more consistently, that would have been really nice. But sadly, they kind of mixed it in with run attack, which cheeses like, I don't know, maybe 70% of the enemies. We're just straight up, if you're about two dash distances away from the enemy and you hold like R1 to run, you essentially just hit them with an attack that breaks their guard. And not any other weapon type can really take advantage of this outside of sword and dagger. So if Axe does it, it doesn't get any follow-up damage. If dagger does it, it's okay, but the damage uh, return is extremely low. Um, so it just ends up making sword very OP compared to the other ones, especially by, as I said before, about the halfway point in the game. Uh, daggers fell off in terms of damage super hard. Um, I think the, the highest dagger we got in our playthrough was, I think, 30 attack. The highest we could have possibly gotten, I think, was 40. And comparatively, the endgame sword was like 95, I think, but it also had a set bonus. So it boosted it all the way to 120. So when you're doing like a third of the damage and you have none of the reach and you can't really break guard. And if you're going to break guard by doing the run attack, the distance of the target doesn't really matter. There's really no point to using the dagger after basically the last dagger upgrade you get in normal progression, which I think is also kind of disappointing. Um, I think some people will get annoyed by the fact that you can't run from combat. If you if you touch an enemy, you are committed. You are fighting that thing to the death. There is no escape. You have to fight it and kill it. The end. Um, I'm kind of mixed whether or not I like the mechanic of the Scepter Force. So the entire purpose is like, if you get a flawless victory, you potentially get a low end item, or you could choose not to get the low end item and gamble it. And if you could keep getting more consecutive uh, kills in a row by mixing different enemy types of which that like to basically prove that you can flawless victory everything, um, then you can unlock better items in terms of drops. But honestly, it, it's okay. I think the problem is, like, it works really well in the beginning dungeons, but by, as I said before, about the halfway point in the game, it's really hard to avoid not taking really cheap chip damage or something. So I feel like, while we might have been able to use it in the first two 
maybe three dungeons of the game. Uh, if we're counting ones that you could revisit anyway. Um, I just didn't really see the point in it. And by the end of the game, it was completely pointless for sure. I was like, good luck getting a flawless victory on this. If you could get a flawless victory on some of those later game enemies, you don't need the items anymore. Like, trust me, you're good. <laughs> If you can fight like the sentinel or like the dragons without getting hit at all, you don't need the items. You already know how to beat the game. <laughs> just trust me. Just go go beat the game if you could do it. It's fine. You're, you'll be fine. Uh, so let, let's back up a moment. So we talked a lot about, about combat, which is a majority of the game, just to be clear. And I think it was important to touch on that. Um, I guess, like, in terms of introducing the character a little better, you're basically Mysterious Boy with Magic Scepter, and you can duplicate items. So instead of finding and shopping for items in a traditional sense, you find pieces of metal or, like, old stones that contain magic spells uh, that will potentially help you on the journey as you go forward. The game is somewhat rewarding for exploring. So I don't feel like there were a lot of points where I felt like, wow, that was pointless when we're going through the dungeons and stuff like that. But, uh, oh, actually, this still ties into the combat. So combat spells. Again, I felt like they were actually really strong, really useful. You have a very limited MP source. It's hard to get money in this game, which if you're not good at the game will basically be a big turnoff because you'll be at a point where you're just kind of in a lose-lose cycle where you basically just can't get out of debt essentially because you'll run out of healing items and there's not really an easy way to get money aside from doing combat and even then money's not guaranteed so i definitely think that's a flaw for players that are i would say definitely getting used to the game and if people turned off from the game at that point i wouldn't blame them i would not blame them for sure it is not a very forgiving game at least in the beginning uh but I think from the standpoint, we unlocked a lot of magic spells, and they were somewhat useful at getting flawless victories in the early dungeons. Like, Fireball was amazingly cheesy at getting kills. It was doing, like, whole, uh, what they consider life points of a target. So they kind of, they kind of have, like, I'm going to call them semi-infinite prevention systems in the game. So the intent is that you have, like, let's say 40 health, and then you have maybe, you know, between 1 and maybe 4 LP for enemies. And what it does is essentially, like, if you deplete 40 health, it consumes an LP, it makes them invincible as they get knocked down, and it basically lets them restart. It's not a perfect system, but it does at least make you do something slightly different than this mash attack over and over. If you happen to know the strategy on some of the enemies, uh, it at least makes it a little different where you have to change up your timing. Uh, and I think it's kind of an interesting way to kind of give you... Uh, I would say like a, a balancing factor against the bosses and the different enemies like at no point in like some of the other more poorly balanced quintet games did i ever get like truly quote unquote one shot like yes they can deplete an entire lp in a hit but that's the most they can deplete so even just going back to the earlier dungeons even if you have like end game items you're not depleting like five lp when you kill them so it's still it still gives them like a little bit of a challenge and it's also kind of like a, a catch-all safety net in terms of difficulty. And I feel like for the most part, the difficulty with the game is fine. It's like a little hard in the beginning because you don't have a lot of the better sword option or not sword options. You don't have some of the better weapon types. And you're also still getting used to the mechanics of the game where you're learning the enemies kind of button read you. Um, I would say probably one of the most irritating enemy types is early. And I'm surprised it was in the first dungeon. That leaping enemy that constantly just goes back and forth over your head is absolutely abysmal. I don't know why they put that in the first dungeon. That's an enemy I would have expected to see in the second dungeon. But honestly, that enemy type was horrendous. I think I hated that more than the endgame sorcerers, the sentinel, uh, the dragons. I was like, that enemy constantly going in iframes is like driving me wild. Hated that enemy type. I'm glad we could avoid encounters, I guess in that flip statement. So we're not forced into a lot of mandatory fights throughout the game. I think if they had been a bit more consistent with the rewards with the enemy, I think the game would have been probably perfectly balanced. So what I mean by that is that uh, some of the annoying enemy types give you a lot of MP if you kill them, and the other more generic, easier enemies tend to give you more cash. And it's not really a mixture of the two, generally speaking, unless you're like 
no, it really generally isn't a mixture of the two, even as you go through the game. So from that standpoint, the enemies that require MP to potentially kill as you're getting used to the game kind of pay for themselves sometimes. But I would have liked if it had been more of a random range. So what I mean by that is like, I wish that killing those enemies always gave you at least some MP, but not guaranteed to like high roll the MP. Because there's a lot of times where like, it's just not worth killing the enemies because potentially you'll be spending a lot of resources unless you know where a save crystal is. It's like, oh boy, I'm at the end of the game. I lost four or five LP because I fought a new enemy type for the first time. And it's like, here's 50 gems. And I'm like, wow, that buys one healing item that heals uh, maybe at most two LP. So I'm just down in cash. And I'm like, we're at the end of the game. I'm just saying, like, we're at the end of the game. I don't feel like most of these enemies are worth fighting at all. And then the early ones are more like, you can come back with better weapons and they definitely can be farmable, quote unquote. And they can get you out of tricky situations if you're not as comfortable with the game. But yeah, as I said before, that very beginning portion of the game, because of the fact that there's so many different enemy types and you don't have access to great spells and spells in general are not really worth it because they consume MP, which sadly in this game is not refilled when you go to an inn or when you use the save crystal. So that is just, if you have 70 MP, you have that until you find an item that gives you it, which is random drop, or maybe sometimes in set chests, or that's it. There's, there's basically no other way to get MP. So you could farm certain enemies if you know that's what they happen to drop. And that will be what you use potentially to kind of like snowball in your favor. But it's, it feels very anti-player. I'm surprised it didn't at least put you up to a minimum number of MP. Like it, like going up to 999 MP is kind of absurd if you go to the crystal, but I feel like from a safety standpoint, it probably should have just always granted you 100 MP. Or it should have been based off your level, like you get, you get a guaranteed 10 MP total because you're level 1, 20 at level 2, 30 at level 3. I think that would have fixed a lot of issues with the game, to be honest with you, if they had done that. Then I would have been using combat spells a lot more often, for sure, because then I could just guarantee I have a certain minimum amount of health, etc. I will say the healing magic, though, was pretty much useful all the way start to finish, especially when you're getting used to more combat encounters and stuff like that. Uh, but otherwise, like, I don't know. Just, it's like at the end of the game when you get an attack that costs 300 MP, I just kind of went, why? We don't, we don't need it. It, if I'm at this point in the game, I should just straight up know how to kill these enemies with melee because there's there's no way I'm funding my MP only career unless I know how to fight. And if I know how to fight, I don't need MP. So it's kind of counterintuitive in that sense, as I said before. And that's mostly just due to the fact that these drops are not guaranteed. Now, granted, as we got into the later dungeons, MP got a lot better than it was in the beginning of the game. Like maybe occasionally you'll get like a 40 MP or a 70 MP enemy. But like towards the end of the game, it's like, here's like 200 MP and here's like a full heal plus 200 MP item. I'm just like, what? Wow, I wish that dropped way earlier in the game would have made it much easier to get to this point. So I think they kind of go a little bit overboard by the end of the game with items, which is really funny because that's where I would expect the inverse to happen in any other game. But uh, that's Quintet for you, I guess. So let's talk about... Okay, so we talked a little bit about the Scepter. Um, it can memorize certain items, which we can use to repair, let's say, card keys or do items in order to like weigh down pressure plates or whatever or it'll be used to store our key items and I, I think it's okay i think the dungeon exploration and puzzles are fine none of them are like ultra hard and i don't feel like they're like super busy work they're pretty quick to do in general so i'm mostly happy with that the plot is mixed i would say there are a lot of animated cutscenes. there are actually several uh entirely voiced over scenes and i also like that when you're talking to people for the most part you'll get a portrait of their character with like a limited set of range of emotions to kind of sell you the story 
And I think that part of the game was actually fairly well done in terms of like presentation, especially for a PS1 game to have that many cinematics and all those other voiced over lines and everything else. I think they actually did a pretty good job there. The problem is more like classic quintet plot happenings. There are just a few points in the game where it just dumps a lot of dumbness on you all at once. Um, it brings up a lot of themes of reincarnation and sacrifice, which is a somewhat interesting topic to go into. I suppose from that standpoint, I think the problem is more that the universe it's set in is not really believable. Like there, like there are things you're willing to suspend your disbelief over. And I'm trying to think of the least plot spoilery thing to say before we go into plot spoilers. I guess the best thing I can say is like, I could not imagine a world in which it's a very well-known post-apocalyptic setting. It's It tells you immediately at the beginning of the game um, that you're on these continents and they're all slowly descending to the earth and when they do, basically all land will submerge and then humanity will cease to exist. That's the whole premise of the game. But the fact that one of the continents is like, it, it needs to be balanced so a volcano doesn't spill and we need to weigh individual people to make sure the lava doesn't spill, like breaks me out of it immediately. I'm like, come on, how, how did they exist for any amount of time in that kind of universe? Like there's other things I can complain about with the plot, but I think that's gonna go more into spoiler territory. Like that, that's a pretty innocent scenario slash setting issue that doesn't really reveal anything about the game. And it's just like one of those things where I'm like, this is really dumb. <laughs> Just like, um, that's a choice, I guess. Also, is this background song just the vibrating sounds of the ship? Can we move to a different song? I'll move it forward slightly, chat. Is there another song? Wow, it really is just like 10 minutes of vibrations. That's crazy. But anyway, chat, um... I do feel like it, it it tackled certain things. It really was. I had to skip through. It was over eight minutes long. That's ridiculous. But from that standpoint, uh, I'm trying to think not going into plot. Some of the plot twists were kind of on the head scratching moments. I, I guess they set up the final boss okay, but it wasn't a very satisfying moment, I suppose. I guess from the standpoint of the towns, I was a little disappointed how small the towns were. Like they, they give the concept of exploring the four remaining continents floating in the sky, but we're going into like fractions of a fraction of the continent. And then at most we go to like two to four important locations and then we're done. So I don't know. I mean, there's like an in-universe explanation as to why there's not that many towns, but at the same time, it feels like kind of unfortunate. I do like that fairly early on when you get alternate means of travel without going into too many details there. Um, I do like that it shows like a 3D model of the continent. I thought that was actually one of those moments where like the rule of cool actually worked in Quintet's favor. I like rotating the continent to find like if you're going to a destination, you can physically see where it is on the continent and it'll like quick snap to the different places. I thought that was actually well done. I'll, I'll give them credit for that. That's like one of the few uses where I wasn't annoyed by like bad menuing and stuff like that from other quintet games, which we are no, we, we, from our experience, we've seen some truly atrocious menus from them. So shout outs to them. Most of the menus were actually pretty good. You know, they weren't very fancy. They did what they needed to do. And honestly, they needed to go back to that. They needed to go back to that after Terranigma. I'm like, please, please present me the information that I actually need. Uh, but kind of going into like the things that aren't really explained, you just have to kind of find out. Like we went basically all the way to the end of the game and never realized there were like armor and weapon set bonuses for, for playing of all of like one armor or weapon type. So like if you put like, for example, one of the end game armors with the end game shield with the end game sword, it gives like a natural boost compared to if you'd split it with other abilities. Like, it, like, you can see the stats rise, but it doesn't really explain it, and it doesn't tell you that it's part of a set. 
necessarily. So I'm curious how many set bonuses we missed early on, because there's a lot of different types of combinations that look somewhat related. But just due to the fact that like the weapons were not optimal to use, we ended up missing quite a few of those. I'm imagining. Um... Oh, actually, there's one more thing I forgot to mention about combat. I do like that the game generally has pretty strong visual cues. Like, you'll see a purple glow if an attack is unblockable. Spells of any color are generally blockable. Green is usually indicating shield. I don't like that it overlaps with heal, necessarily, because sometimes I think I'm going to get pushed backwards, but it's just the enemy healing, and it's like, ah, ha ha, got you. Um, or it does a wind strike, which are all very similar colors. Again, I, I would have liked the, those colors to be a little different, but I think for the most part, you can react to what the enemy is doing throughout. So it's a because it's a slower paced game, it's not like I'm inputting like a 30 million hit combo in like a couple seconds kind of thing. Um, I think generally speaking, it was fine. I didn't enjoy some combat with the regular enemy types because they did just straight up read your buttons and or they had very annoying... Uh, setups you needed to do to potentially make them easily damageable. Uh, but I think for the most part, I did have fun playing through the game. I would say there's only a couple segments of the game itself where I was like, oh, okay. I was like, oh, okay, wrap it up. And that mostly had to deal with the fact that, again, like, there's sometimes, like, really annoying arena gimmicks. Oh, battle music. <sighs> really, really annoying arena gimmicks. I guess I'll give one example. Uh, there was one time we were fighting a boss, and the arena basically constantly resized and stretched, so it would slide you closer or further from your target. Man, that fight was super irritating. <laughs> like, I like that they were trying to experiment to make it not always a 1v1, and I wish they had done that a little more throughout. I think there's only one other time in the game where you had to fight multiple portions at once, potentially. And I understand it's because the camera auto locks on the target, and for the most part, it's completely fine for the 1v1s. But I would have liked to have seen a little more variety throughout the game, which is unfortunate. On the plus side, if you are tired of the 1v1s, as I mentioned before, most of the combat is skippable. So we don't really... Oh, actually, that's one thing I've totally forgot to explain. So when we fight enemies, there is there is level ups in this game, but they're tied to plot events and or potentially side quests. But there's no XP for actually fighting monsters. So the incentive to actually fight in this game is incredibly low. So pretty much by... Honestly, the first 25% of the game. Outside the first 25% of the game, we basically just ran from every encounter, and we were totally fine. As long as we explored, got the chests to potentially add LP to ourselves, or looked for armor or weapons in the dungeon to make sure we did more damage against the boss that was inevitable in these kinds of dungeons. Uh, yeah, I, I, it, did, I, it did not feel super rewarding to fight the monsters, unless you got a perfect victory. But again, if you have a perfect victory, then you don't really need the rewards for them. It, it, it's kind of like, I don't know. They they tried, it kind of worked. If they just tweaked the, the reward system a little bit more, it could have been better, I would have said. But yeah, kind of unfortunate. I do like that overall, without going into specifics, the game balance felt mostly fine. There were maybe two dungeons out of all of them where it felt like we did like hilariously little damage and it was like 1000% necessary we had to find the weapon. Like we we skipped doing everything to go find this weapon because there was just no way we were killing anything in this dungeon. Um, and it happened a couple of times, which is unfortunate. But a lot of the times, usually just having the weapon from the previous dungeon was good enough to get us to our next place. Um, but there were a couple times where it was like, what was it, Chad? Like the fireplace, for example, where we basically went from needing like 42 or 44 hits we counted to kill an enemy to 12. Like that kind of jump in power is ludicrous. Like I know they wanted to have like the elemental weakness system as like another way to encourage you to use different weapon types. But that also meant that if your weapons didn't have that weakness, it just took like a literal eternity to kill anything. 
So kind of unfortunate that they did that a couple times as we listen to the boss music. Uh, general topics before spoilers. Music very good. I think the music is very iconic. If I hear like the battle theme or the boss music here, I would I would know the game instantly. So the good job to the composers. I think the art direction was mostly fine. The problem is not the FMVs or the portraits of the characters or even necessarily the level design or overworld monsters where they're kind of simplified. There's not like crazy textures or anything on them. I'm not expecting that on a PS1 game for sure. Uh, where they kind of failed a little bit, I would say probably would be the character models in 3D themselves. Not because I didn't recognize the characters, they just didn't put eyes and mouths on the 3D models. Even if they had gone for like the Metal Gear Solid pixelated blur, it would have been much better. So they come, they kind of come across as creepy mannequins, which I think is a shame because whoever did like the cinematography for a lot of the 3D cutscenes, I feel actually did a really good job. I very rarely call this out in games, but I really like the different camera angles that they use throughout. And it's just such a shame it's ruined by like their dumb, like literally faceless faces. <laughs> Like they had like uh, like some of my favorite moments are definitely in the beginning of the game where like, for example, uh, you get to see the perspective of that slow walking armor monster for the first time as it creeps up on you and takes a swing at your protagonist. Or it does like a lot of the dramatic kind of like off kilter angles for some of the cutscenes, or it focuses in on the characters, you know, doing the animations of praying or doing other things. Mannequin's Continent Adventure, basically. And it, it's such a shame because if the models had just been a little better, it wouldn't have been like, it became funny because of the fact that they were faceless. But like, you could tell like with the animations of the characters and like the camera direction that it was actually really well done. And it's just like that one small thing really ruins the big impact of the game. Because as I said before, I really liked the drawn portraits. There weren't like a whole ton of them, but they were enough to convey the characters. And the voice acting was okay. There was like clearly like one or two very talented voice actors and then other people were like, oh no, watch out. Like there's always, there's, there's definitely going to be that, especially with the early games. And, it, and I think it is a shame because I think for the most part, I had fun going through most of the dungeons. Uh, I did, I did like watching most of the cutscenes. Um, some of the cutscenes are skippable, which is, again, very surprising to me. Whenever I see skippable cutscenes, that always makes me smile. I'm like, oh, PS2 games, you could have you could have taken a lesson from some of these games. If they had cutscenes skip here, you should have had cutscenes skip. No excuses. No excuses, chat. Uh, but I think from the standpoint, I don't have anything else to talk about uh, that it would be spoiler free. I think we covered enough. Like, I, as, as I said before, I think it did mostly hold up. I had a fun with it. It's not my favorite game of all time. I'm not going to call it, like, my top five in PS1. But I think it was an interesting thing to experience. I, I actually kind of wish we saw more updated versions of this game in the future. Because I think they did a lot of things. Like, they were... I don't know if I want to use the word overambitious. I don't know if they ran out of development time with some of the balancing of the special moves or something, but like they had all the right ideas. They just flubbed on like a core couple of things and that stops the game from being like a eight out of 10. So it's like for me, it's like a six and a half, maybe a seven, maybe. I had fun with it. There are points in the game where I was like, okay, let's just move on. Um, it doesn't have like a lot of replay factor either, which not, not necessarily like a make or break with it, but it's one of those ones where I'm not like, oh, I really love the combat. Let's get into it. I think it was just fun. You know what? There's no there's no problem with that. The games don't have to be the best of worst of of all time. But anyway, chat, let's let's talk about spoilers since uh, there's I don't think there's a way I could describe any of the characters in this uh, other than they were just OK for the most part. So let, let's run down through the cast and talk about whether or not I feel like they worked in the game, to be honest with you. Eon was okay. He was kind of your stand-in protagonist. I don't really have any additional comments on him. Uh, Ma'o reveal was kind of whatever related to him. I didn't really feel one of the endings of the game based off of that, for sure. But it is what it is. Uh, Laramie, 
I wish we had gotten to see her do more combat stuff. Like, I love that she just had like a battle axe and a morning star when she was in her personal quarters. I would have loved to have seen her club somebody in like a cutscene. I feel like that was a big missed opportunity. Um, she comes off as like very bratty and kind of off-putting initially. And I understand that people don't like the character, but uh, compared to the other female lead, I definitely preferred Laramie, be real with you. Um, then you have Arcia, the other female, who's like, Oh no, everything's my fault. I'm useless. I'm holding you back. Oh, I gotta do something. And she has like this kind of like savior complex with characters. I did not relate to this character at all. I'll be real with you. Um, it just, she's there. I, it just, it felt like she was more of like the stereotypical JRPG female character. She hit a lot of the tropes that you see in those kinds of characters, which is why I think I just gravitated towards Laramie a bit more, where she was more assertive and independent for the most part. And I, I like that in female characters in these kinds of games. I, I don't want to be like babysitting them or holding their hand. And we had to do that a lot with Arcia. And I was just like, ugh. We need, it, we need to get, like, a kidnap counter going. How many times did she get kidnapped in this game, chat? Was it twice? Three times? I lost track. <laughs> but it's like, come on. Like, man, you just... Stop going places. You're killing me. <laughs> you, you have your one continent uh, kidnapping minimum up until the final continent, I guess. And even then, she got kidnapped in Hades, technically. So maybe it's more like three or four. But yeah, it's just like your your Arceus in another floating fortress kind of thing. It just got kind of annoying to me. I was like, can you just let them keep Arcea? Let's talk about the wise men on the whole. I understand what they were trying to go for, but they came off as like the stupidest people I've ever seen. Didn't count, not worth the effort, oof. It's just like, their whole thing is like, okay, so we know verses that will raise the continents, and if the verses are used for evil, question mark whatever the heck that technically means in the concept of the game when you by the time you get to the end of it um then you know bad things will happen question mark but like half of the characters we talked to didn't know they were descendants or they and or they didn't know the lifting verse so like what were they gonna do in like a single generation beyond arcia for example, because Arcea didn't know the lifting verse and she would not have been able to survive the dungeon either. So this is where I kind of have a problem with the universe setting. Like there's con there's points of it that would like are OK, but the fact that it's like when you when you take it, when you kind of scale it back a little and you think about how the universe itself works, the universe just doesn't work. So it just doesn't make any sense. So you're telling me if at any point Arcea had died, Literally every continent is doomed, yet none of the other ones can recite their own lifting verse. And why don't the other ones know the lifting verse? Why is there a not why is there not a uh, non-dangerous route that they could take to go get the lifting verse if they don't know it? I'm just shaking my head. The wise men came across as idiots. I'm just saying, like it got worse the further we went. Then we had uh what was his name? Wiseman Zeroist. The guy who just somehow split into two and we're just like, yeah, that just happens. Your light and dark side just become two people. That was a really dumb plot point. Not really well integrated, never really comes up again for any other character. I feel like maybe that was supposed to be the throwback to like Illusion of Gaia, where you have a light and dark version of yourself. But uh, yeah, that just came across as super awkward. And we would have saved so much time by just killing the good version. So many bad things would not have happened if we just killed a good version of him. Uh, let's see. Then you had Slazer with one of the most edgy names of all time. He just decides that he has to sacrifice himself and he'll save the scepter. Again, there's a there's a couple points in the game where it just straight up tells you plot points, but it doesn't really go into details as to why it works or any lore behind it. They're like, oh, you must take my soul. Therefore, you could win. And I'm like, when was this established that we needed to take souls? We're just establishing this in the last hour of the game? Okay. I'm glad that literally nothing else we did brought us up to this point. Like, they talked about, too, that if people are dead, we can hear their spirits or whatever. 
And that also basically did not play any role in the plot at all outside of the first continent and the very end of the game. Like that was just an ability the Scepter had and we just straight up never used it. So that was a bit weird. Uh, I guess the pirates for the most part were okay. They were okay. Not a lot of them were memorable other than maybe Slazer and uh... I was about to call him Goron. Let's just call him Dogi. There's a character that's very clearly supposed to be kind of like Dogi from East. He even wall smashes to get out of jail, which is Dogi's big thing in the East series. So re your your resident JRPG stand-in for Dogi was also okay. Other than that, like, I, I like some of the villains we came across, like Salela, for example, be becoming the cult leader. I actually liked interacting with the cult and being thrown in prison. I didn't like that we had to literally mine twice to escape. That was kind of a waste of time. Mining once would have been enough for sure. And there were some side characters we could check up on, but I think in general, the game was kind of weak in terms of like keeping the characters consistent and showing updates over time, which I think is a shame because generally if you look back to things like Actraiser, uh, Illusion of Gaia, even Terranigma, they did better jobs of having like character arcs with the minor characters or seeing like how their life changed over time. And we got to see like a little bit of that in one of the endings where we get to see like life after the protagonists are done. But I mean more kind of like throughout the game itself, like it, Basically, we lose and or every character we care about dies by the end of the game. Spoilers, I guess. So we don't really get to see a lot of what the other NPCs do. Like maybe one or two of them have a side quest that's completely optional that advances their story. Like, for example, I think there was like the town uh, song person, for example, getting married in church is a completely optional thing. And, you know, it, it, it adds a bit more depth to the game. But I think overall, there were just several characters that once you're done with the continent, nothing happens with them. You basically never talk to them again, except to maybe get a single item, maybe. So they introduced a lot of minor characters, but most of them didn't really go anywhere, sadly, outside of their own continent. Um, anything else? I would say I think we covered most of those. The main villain being Ma'o, or basically the great evil, and surprise, we are the great Ma'o, technically. We were that one person they kept harping on about every time we collected a spirit stone. Was a bit disappointing, honestly. I was kind of hoping more that they were going to go through, like, us having an actual dark side, and that, like, the other portion of us was Ma'o sort of like Illusion of Gaia style. So I wasn't really happy that it was like, no, we just were that other person, period. So it hit upon the theme of reincarnation, but not in a way that I felt was super satisfying. Otherwise, chat, it's just like, uh... They built up the wizardry fight, for example, like the whole time we're trying to deal with their forces or whatever. And then, like, the actual fight with the wizardry guy was kind of brain-dead easy. It was more just like, once you figured out run attack, you, you were good. It just becomes a war of attrition kind of thing. And sometimes you get a little unlucky, and he, he does, like, the close sweep earlier versus, like, a long-range attack. But otherwise, I don't know. There's not there there weren't like a lot of overarching villains per se. Like we did interact with evil forces. Like Salela was probably my favorite in terms of things because we had like the such over the top evil characters in that particular arc that I had entertainment from it, um, including pushing the sun off the tower kind of things. It was interesting to see her kind of sort of have a redemption arc, I guess. Sort of. But yeah, it, it was fun to break up the cultists. I'll put it that way. It was it was fun to destroy the cultists in the game. I, as I said before, I wish they had more villains that kind of link between the different areas. Like, we didn't really interact with them at all uh, in the first continent. The third continent, we kind of did. Kind of. And the fourth continent, we did one more time. But again, it was all just kind of like one person. The Belzebar, or whatever his name was. But whatever, chat. 
I don't think I have anything else to talk about that would be spoilers. I just think the game was, you know, I don't think there, to me, there wasn't like a super iconic villain. So the game will never have like that appeal factor. Is that I think the protagonist really shines depending on like the hardships, adversities, and the villain that is the foil to them. Uh, potentially bringing out their true potential as an interesting character or to present interesting dilemmas to the player. Um, this game just kind of, they were okay. They were very run of the mill. I could mistake the final boss for every other JRPG demon guy that attains ultimate power. Like, to me, a very interchangeable final boss. Um, but otherwise, it's just... It was okay. I, I did I did like going back to the game. Just because I, I played, like, maybe just, like, the very first dungeon of the game and then just never go, got back to it. And I don't feel like it was a regret play. Like, I... I I'm not going to say this is a before, not my favorite game, but it wasn't a Terranigma. It was much better than Terranigma. I don't know if I would enjoy this more than Illusion of Gaia, though, like in terms of comparing to the other Quintet games. And I definitely did not enjoy this game as much as Act Razor. Illusion of Gaia had some very mixed portions of the game that did make me very angry. This game's lows were not as low as Illusion of Gaia's lows, but I think the highs in Illusion of Gaia were much better. The plot fell apart way faster in Illusion of Gaia, so it's also kind of hard to tell which plot I like more. I like like the first half of the game of Illusion of Gaia, minus Mew. Mew is terrible. Screw the screw that dungeon and screw the vampires. Um, yeah, not not their worst game, <laughs> not their worst game, but if they just cleaned it up a little bit more, I I would have put it more on level or on par with Illusion of Gaia. I don't think it would ever touch Act Razor, to be honest with you. From the games that we played so far, because Act Razor was basically everything I wanted in a game, period. Um, but I think from that standpoint, they did fine. I'm sad more people didn't play it when it came out. I think back then it would have been even better to experience, especially when you have less to compare with like modern amenities. They even fixed a lot of problems that some of the other uh, Quintet games have, which was frequent save points, save points restored HP, um, ability to easily warp out of dungeons without using items, and generally speaking, there is less BS invincible phases in their bosses. I'm not going to say they didn't exist, but there was, I felt like there was more skill to defeat the boss in the phase in which the boss is targetable, rather than being a one-hit-and-wait situation. Like, the closest it came to a one-hit-and-wait situation was probably the Sorcerer, uh, that we fought after Salazla, or in the second continent, you know what I mean. But I feel like if you trap him with proper movement or use certain weapons, instead of just getting a single hit or maybe two hits, you can get up to like four to eight. So it was interesting to, you know, the game did feel like it rewarded you for experimenting with dashes and run versus like blocking and baiting. And I like that portion of the mechanics. I just wish the other portions of the game went to the same level, sadly. And they didn't. But anyway, chat, those are my final thoughts. If you'd like to place any final thoughts here, you can immortalize them here in the video chat. Otherwise, I don't think I have any additional topics to talk about. I think we covered basically everything I wanted to talk about with this game. We'll give chat a moment or two to type if they want to say something. Is there anything I forgot to mention? Oh, there were some useless items. <laughs> I forgot to talk about those, I guess. So... I really don't understand why they put Panther Eye in the game. I'm gonna be honest with you. Mimics are probably one of the only enemy types that were worth fighting, as long as they drop their reward. Like, we got things like Fool Heals, and like, all sorts of crazy MP restores, or like, bazillions amounts of cash. Meanwhile, it's like, you can use this one-time consumable Panther Eye, which to me, the only time it would technically be used is if you want to cheese the game and immediately turn left when you're in the church staircase and use that to find the ultimate weapon, the Onimaru. <laughs> like, aside from doing that to break the game, there were, there were a lot of spells that just didn't have a use, and sadly that just came down to MP or items that were basically pointless. And I think some of that was like a balancing issue in that we were better than the game expected, so therefore we never ran out of healing items or MP recovery. 
excuse me, and at the same time, it just meant that, like, if we could beat it without the spells, like, we, we could have used, like, Strength Up, for example, to defeat certain bosses faster, but at the same time, we had, like, thousands of MP, so I, I could beat the boss in any way that I want at that point, because we're just winning at the game so hard. So take that as you will, I suppose. If you don't like using a ton of items, I mean, we beat the like, we beat the game with very minimal usage, I would say. We we had to use a couple herbs in the beginning, and sure, we used heal a couple times, like in the midpoint of the game, in particular after some annoying uh, new enemy types. But otherwise, I wasn't pausing like literally every second outside of maybe the first dungeon as we're getting used to combat and trying out different weapons. But by like, as I said before, probably the second or third continent or about like a little past the quarter of the game, uh, we had a good flow down. And for the most part, you know, if I'm in combat, I'm in combat the whole time. I'm not constantly menuing like some of the other games. <laughs> like, I oh, actually, I'll, I'll give them credit for this. I did like that they had overworld magic versus in-battle magic. So if you just wanted to heal outside of combat, that's an option, and you don't have to constantly swap between spells. And I like that if you wanted to use offensive magic, whether it's a buff or damage dealer or something else, you could also put it there uh, to save yourself some time. So as I said before, the menuing in this game was a lot better, and I, I will give them extra credit because they're really bad at menus normally, Chad. They're like, I'm gonna give them a round of applause. They learned, finally, how to do menus. It felt like how an RPG should be. And I'm gonna call it out for them because they, they can't do it normally. They're very bad at menus. <laughs> Let me be really clear. They are really bad at menus normally. So I'm happy that it, it had better uh, setup for that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the only other thing I didn't talk about was uh, guarding, I guess, in the game. There are attacks that go through your guard that are unblockables, so it does force you to do a mix of potentially guarding and evading to get through certain enemy attacks, which I, I think is fair. I think that was completely fair for the enemy to have some unblockable attacks. I just wish the inverse was true. There are several weapon strikes in particular, like those super slow swing of the axe that should have just been unblockable, to be real with you. If you're inputting special inputs, if unless it comes out nearly instantly and can be chained into your normal strikes, it should have been unblockable. I'll be real with you. Especially the axe ones that were purple. I feel like that was really deceptive to use that purple graphic on the axe moves in particular, where the enemy can block those. But it's like, but then just don't use purple on it. Use a different color, you idiots. So anyway, aside from that chat, I think we covered everything. So we'll talk a little bit after this particular final thought, uh, but I think that's all for today. So let's go ahead and say goodbye to YouTube one last time. So if you did watch to this point in the video of the bot, I'd just like to say thank you again for watching. Hope to see you again in the next game.